Author Mary Cassian says reading the Bible can be like enjoying a good piece of chocolate. I've had several times when it's just scripture has, it, there's been like a breakthrough in terms of approaching scripture and the way that I read it. And when the Holy Spirit shows me something out of scripture that grips my heart, I just get so excited about it. It's so nourishing and it's so exciting and encouraging. It's like a really good good piece of chocolate or something, <laughs> you know, just, it, it, it's spiritual food, but it's just so tasty that it, you go, oh, I want another piece. Oh, I would like another piece. You know how that goes, ladies. And I think really when you've tasted the goodness of scripture, that's what it's like. It's like, wow, that tasted so good. I want more. This week, we'll learn to savor God's Word on the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of A Place of Quiet Rest. For January 10th, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. Nancy often challenges us to read God's Word every day. This week, you'll see why taking her up on a challenge like this is so valuable as Nancy brings us to a series called The Wonder of the Word. She'll begin by explaining that the Bible is unique. You know, the Bible is in a class by itself. When you use the word unique, uh, technically you shouldn't say, or grammatically you shouldn't say most unique or very unique because unique means there's only one like it. It's one of a kind. It stands alone. And it is true, absolutely true, that the Bible is unique. No other book can compete with it. The Bible, by the way, is the best-selling book of all time. It sells throughout the world, I'm told, at the rate of 80,000 copies a day. The Bible is sold at that rate. It's read by more people and published in more languages than any other book in the history of the world. And unquestionably, the Bible has had the greatest impact of any book on the history of civilization, on art, on literature, on culture. It's been influenced by the Word of God. Now, as many of you know, the Bible is actually a collection of books, 66 separate documents that were written over a period of more than 1,500 years by more than 40 human authors who came from a wide variety of backgrounds. Two of the writers were kings, two were priests, one was a medical doctor, a couple were fishermen, some were shepherds. Remember the apostle Paul was a Pharisee and a theologian. Matthew was a tax collector. Joshua was a soldier. Ezra was a scribe. Nehemiah was a butler. So a whole wide variety of backgrounds. And yet, considering that These different books were written over a millennium and a half by 40 different authors. It's amazing that the Bible holds together as one single unit. The same theme. It's never contradictory. And all those different pieces written by those different human authors are held together by a theme of who God is and what is his redemptive plan to have a relationship with sinful man. That's the story of the Bible. The Bible is one long love story. It's a story of God's great plan of redemption. There are many different things about the scripture that could be used to point out its uniqueness. But one of those that I think is particularly remarkable is the incredible accuracy of the prophecies that we find in the scripture. I think, for example, of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament that gives numerous minute details about various kingdoms of the world that did not even exist yet. Hundreds of years before those kingdoms were even nations. And yet he told what those nations would be and details about how they would be overthrown and what their characteristics would be. It was a foreview of world history remarkably specific long before he could possibly have known what was going to happen because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, On another vein of thinking here as it relates to prophecy, the Old Testament contains over 300 references to the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, including 60 major prophecies of details that were written hundreds of years before Christ was born and were totally beyond his human control. 
For example, the Old Testament tells us the place of the Messiah's birth. It tells us the time of his birth. It tells us the way that he would be born. It gives minute details about his earthly ministry, his miracles, his parables. It talks about the rejection of Jesus and the betrayal by a friend that was predicted hundreds of years before it happened. The Old Testament prophesies how Jesus or the Messiah, fulfilled by Jesus, the manner of his death. Hundreds of years before crucifixion was even known as a method of execution. And yet the Old Testament describes, in the book of Psalms, the crucifixion of the Messiah. It gives details about his burial, about his resurrection, and his ascension. Different writers have marveled about how this could be true, and they've tried to figure out what is the probability of taking these prophecies and, and in such detail and seeing them fulfilled in one person. Peter Stoner wrote a book called Science Speaks, and in that book, he calculated the probability of just eight of those prophecies being fulfilled in one man. And mathematically, he said the probability would be one in 100 quadrillion. Now, in case you don't happen to know how much a quadrillion is, 100 quadrillion is a one with 17 zeros. That is the chance of just eight of those prophecies, mathematically, being fulfilled in one person, and they were all fulfilled in Christ. To comprehend what that means, because uh, those numbers are kind of mind-boggling to me, Stoner illustrates it this way in his book. He says, take 100 quadrillion silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. Spread them out, they'll cover the whole state two feet deep. So imagine the whole state of Texas, two feet deep in these silver dollars. Now he says, Mark, put an X on one of those silver dollars. And then blindfold a man and tell him he can go as far as he wants in the state of Texas, but he has to pick out the one silver dollar that you've marked. Of course, we know it's impossible. Well, mathematically, it's not impossible. There's one chance in 100 quadrillion, that, that's one with 17 zeros, that he will pick up the right silver dollar. And this writer said, what chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote them in their own wisdom. But they didn't write them in their own wisdom. They were inspired by the Spirit of God. And so what was written was stuff that God knew. He knew it was going to happen. He foreordained, he foreknew these things, and he inspired these human authors to know what they could not have known on their own. And all of those prophecies either have come true, as many, many have, and that gives us confidence that the ones that haven't yet will yet be fulfilled. There are other evidences of the uniqueness of God's word. I like to think of the word of God as being, I, I call it peerless. There's nothing that holds a candle to it. There's no other book that can come close to it. Uh, there's the archaeological evidence. And one renowned Jewish archaeologist wrote, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. There are entire civilizations and cities and towns referred to in the Old Testament that until recent years, scholars said, the Bible must not be true because that city never existed. And in recent years, in some cases, the scholars, the, the archaeologists have gone into those parts of the world and have uncovered remains that people did not know about until just recent years. Science, the more, the more science uncovers and discovers, the more it proves the accuracy of the Word of God. I love that verse in Psalm 119 that says, I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Broad. It's the consummation of perfection. It's peerless. It's unique. And so what does that mean for us? Well, it means first that the Bible is trustworthy. You can believe it. It's an incredible book, and it should hold a unique place in our lives. If the Bible is a peerless book, and it is, then should not it hold a unique place in our lives? Should the Bible be just one book on our bookshelves of hundreds of other books? Should the Bible take a place in our lives that is secondary to 
all the other novels and magazines and paperback books and textbooks and things that we enjoy reading. It's the Word of God. It's God's heart to us. He's made it available to us. It's unique. It's peerless. It's exceedingly broad. It's the consummation of all perfection. And that's why I'm challenging you. Get to know the Word of God. You know, a lot of people say, I just can't understand this book. And I will acknowledge to you after reading this book, since I could first read, um, there are still places. I found some in my quiet time this morning, and I'm thinking, what does this mean? I've read this many times over the years, and I still don't understand. But I find that most people who say they can't understand the Word of God either don't know God, they don't have a relationship with Christ, so they don't have the spiritual capacity to understand the Word of God, or they're not reading the Word of God. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes desire and commitment. But you dig in. You start to search, and you will find that this book truly is unique. It's life-changing. You can trust it. So I want to challenge you. Make that commitment. Start to spend time, if you're not doing it already, reading the Word of God. You won't understand it all, but what you do understand will be enough to change your life. Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has been inviting you to dig for treasure in God's Word. That message is part of a series called The Wonder of the Word. Here in January, we're bringing you several series on the Bible to encourage you to take a challenge Nancy often gives. Here she is to explain more. When you get into God's Word and get God's Word into you, it can't help but have a huge effect on your life. I believe that so strongly that that's why I offered a challenge to all our listeners to spend some time every day throughout this year getting into God's Word. During our current series, The Wonder of the Word, I want to encourage you, if you've taken that challenge with us, to keep it up. And if this is the first time you've heard about the challenge, or you've heard about it but you haven't got started into it, it's not too late. And it's really simple. The commitment is just to spend some time in God's Word every day. Now, that may mean you have to spend a little less time on Facebook or a little less time reading other books or with some other hobbies, but I want to assure you that it's worth it. Getting a daily dose of God's Word is going to have a huge effect on your life. Thanks, Nancy. I know it really will. Now, to help you launch into this daily habit, Nancy's put together a simple but powerful resource, the Place of Quiet Rest Journal. It walks you through 30 days of devotional readings and gives you an easy place to journal your thoughts and prayers. It's something we here at Revive Our Hearts want to send you as our way of thanking you for your donation to support Revive Our Hearts. Just ask about the devotional journal when you contact us at reviveourhearts.com or when you call 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. In the time we have left today, we're going to hear part of a conversation between Nancy and Scott Lindsay. He's an expert at using technology to aid in Bible study, but in the early 1990s, before he started working on high-tech methods of studying Scripture, his love for the Bible itself was growing. I uh, came to faith in the military. I was active duty, Air Force, a couple months before Desert Storm kicked off. Um, Got invited one evening to an evangelistic service at a church in Phoenix, and I heard the gospel for the first time, and it just rocked my world. Mm. Uh, So new creature in Christ. The next morning, my roommates thought I'd lost my mind (laughs) because here I am talking about Jesus, and I'm reading my Bible. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, the Lord used my testimony and three of or two of my roommates act, actually end up giving their lives to the Lord within six months as well and so it was just awesome but so as a brand new Christian you just had this hunger brand to I just get wanted into God's to know word. the Lord I wanted to know the Lord so bad and so and anyway I, let me just interrupt you there I think that is such a key thing because for people who think that Bible study is dull or boring in this entertainment crazed world we want to remind them that it's not about just knowing what's in the Bible the goal of that is to know the Lord. Right. If you want to know Him, this is where He has revealed Himself. So your hunger to know the Lord as a baby Christian led you to 
study your Bible. Well, and then Desert Storm kicked off, and so I got orders overseas, and I, I was a little scared because I, I know the military culture sometimes cannot be so uh, – Christian, if you will. I mean, not it, a hot house for, uh, yeah, for spiritual exactly. development. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's a lot of temptation, a lot of people against uh, what I stood for now. Um, so anyway, I went to a Christian bookstore with my paycheck and a duffel bag. You're allowed two duffel bags when you uh, get sent overseas. And I asked the Christian bookstore manager, I said, I'm a new believer. I know nothing and I need to know my stuff. And so we went through the Christian bookstore and filled that duffel bag with, uh, you know, Bill Bright and Josh McDowell and apologetics and general survey, New Testament, Old Testament. And so for the couple years I was overseas, I kind of, I created my own mini Bible college. <laughs> I was the student, the teacher, I gave myself the diploma, I mean, but I just had a hunger for the Word. Mm. I wanted to know what I believe now. I wanted to know what it was this amazing uh, Savior who redeemed me and, and bought me, and I, I wanted to know him. And so that kind of began my journey, and I got out of the service, got into some ministry, and then the Lord saw fit to uh, provide a open the door for me to join this amazing company. And I'm, I'm really excited about what we do because I'm really disturbed with the decline in Bible study, and I think this is a way that we can redeem that uh, that trend that we can get people into the Word of God. I know that you share the concern I have. You're, you're speaking in conferences all across the country. I'm meeting women all across the country. And one of the things we often come across is how people don't know God's Word. Are you? I mean, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I have the awesome privilege of working with many wonderful ministries whose sole focus is Bible study. So Woodrow Kroll and K. Arthur and, I mean, the thing that I'm hearing from most ministries whose focus is teaching people how to yeah. study the Word and get into the Word is the troubling decline that they see in the body of Christ with their pursuit of God's Word. So we see this trend as well, and we think actually what we're doing is helping address that trend because everybody's kind of going tech. But when we ask people, why aren't you studying the Word of God, the number one excuse that we hear is, I don't have time. Um, I don't think it's necessarily that they don't want to study God's Word. Uh, probably the number two reason we hear is, I don't know where to start. So either they don't have enough time or I don't want to, to I just don't know how yeah. to. Now, for people that are saying that, uh, they have probably done paper Bible study. So they've had a concordance out and a commentary in their Bible and their highlighters. And it's a long process. It's very tedious and time-consuming. Um, but one of the things that really uh, shocked me as a parent was the statistic that the age group right now between 14 and 18, by the time they graduate college, more than 75% of what they learn, they will learn electronically. So parents have got to understand that. Pastors have got to understand that. Church leaders have got to understand that. Because the problem is we keep forcing this paper paradigm on them. So one of the little experiments I'll do at a lay conference is I'll kind of differentiate the crowd. I'll say, okay, everybody 25 and younger, don't respond to this question. Everybody 25 and older, I want you to verbally respond to the question I'm about to ask you. But 25 and younger, be quiet. I'm going to ask you the same question, but let's wait. So I say, okay, ready? I'm going to say a word, and I want you to tell me what's the first word that comes in your mind. And the word that I say is study. And all the older adults say books. Right. Study is books. Right. Then I ask the same question to 25 and younger, study. And what do they say? Computer. Wow. They say electronic. They say yeah. Kindle or iPhone or Google or whatever. And it, it's a real shocking revelation to the parents that are in the audience because, again, they're frustrated with the fact that their young person isn't excited about Bible study. The problem is they keep pushing that paper thing on them. And it's like, that's not the way they want to study. That's not the way they're accustomed to study. You know, prior to the Reformation in the Middle Ages, the mindset for centuries was that only the 
spiritual leaders should be studying the Word. And the lay people were just supposed to take it for granted. You know, they were just supposed to listen to the, to the paid clerics preach the Word or study the Word. But part of the a, a keynote of the Reformation was that lay people should be able to read the Bible in their own language, should be able to have a copy of the Bible, and should be able to study it for themselves. Of course, with the help of people who um, had studied the Scripture more thoroughly, I think we need a reformation again today to get us as lay people back into studying the Word because we tend to think, let the pastor do it for me. Let this author do it for me. I, Me study the Word? And we're saying, yes, you can study the Word yourself, and you've got to be studying the Word yourself. Yeah, I'm so thankful to live in the age that we live in with the Internet and with radio and with TV. And, I mean, we have access to now to some of the best teaching out there. I mean, we revive our hearts. My wife is a huge fan, and that's great to actually uh, hear the Bible taught by people that have invested their lives studying Scripture. But that's no excuse to not study the Bible for yourself. You can't live your you, you can't live off of somebody else's faith or right. somebody else's walk. They can edify you. They can help you understand things a little bit better. But it's but no I, substitute. And for I think your own people study. have given there's kind of been a cop out or an excuse today that we have so much great teaching out there now that why should I? And I, I, you know what? They do all the work. They get all the blessing. And I'm saying to our listeners, if you'll do some of the work yourself and dig in, even for minutes a day, you will experience the joy and the blessing and the reward that other Bible teachers are experiencing because they're getting in and digging for themselves. And let me just challenge the listeners because, you know, it's, gr- it's great to be part of a wonderful church and to have your kids involved. And But if if your children do not see the Word of God being a priority in your own life. So dads and moms, if they don't see you studying the Bible, if they don't see you reading Scripture, um, you you can't expect it in their lives. There's no reason for them to think it really matters if it doesn't really matter to you. Right. One of my favorite quotes that I'll close at conferences with is Howard Hendricks says that we know enough to own a Bible, but not enough for the Bible to own us. And that is really my goal. I want the Bible to so saturate my mind, my life, my walk, uh, that I'm, I just submit to the authority of it and I, I walk in it. And the more I do that, the more healthy my marriage becomes, the better dad I become, uh, the better employee I become, the better friend I become. Um, but it really is in direct proportion to how much time I spend with Jesus and his word. And I want to encourage every listener to take steps forward to build into your life, your heart, and into your children's lives and hearts and and those others that you influence, a heart and a love for the Word of God. There is just nothing that is nearly as rewarding as that pursuit. Scott Lindsay is an expert on using technology to study the Bible. He helps men and women around the world get into God's Word and get God's Word into them using a Bible study software called Logos. It's my go-to when I'm studying God's Word. I just love it. You'll find a link to that software in the transcript of this program at reviveourhearts.com. And don't forget about the Place of Quiet Rest journal that I mentioned earlier. All the details about it are there at our website, reviveourhearts.com. When one of the kings of Judah received the word of God on a scroll, he cut it up and threw it into the fire. You'd never do that, right? Before answering, you'd better listen to tomorrow's program and hear more of the story. When they heard all these words, verse 16, they looked at each other in fear and said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. So they responded by believing what they heard. Now these men take the scroll and they go into the king and they say, you need to hear what we've just heard. This is what God says. Now turn to verse 22. They're meeting with the king. It was in the ninth month and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. The king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear. 
nor did they tear their clothes as a symbol of humility or repentance. We hope you can be here for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants to inspire confidence in God's Word and call you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.